Lord. Let's say praise the Lord. To God be the glory. How many of you know he's doing great things? We thank God for these young people and the tremendous job that they just did. Let's celebrate our young people today. Come on, we can do better than that. Celebrate these young people. I tell you, children are about a third of our population, but they are 100% of our future. And we need to just remind them how important they are by celebrating them as regularly as we can. Amen? What a great job they are doing. I bring you greetings from Oakwood University, your school in Huntsville, Alabama. And it's just good to be back here in New York. It seems like I spend more time in Northeastern than my own conference. I'm going to ask uh, the bishop to put me on the payroll. Amen. But it's good to see you. My wife is here, and if you could wave at me, I think they were looking for you earlier. She's got friends in New York. They might have stepped out for a minute. Don't step too far. Amen. But it is good to, to be back. I am just pleased to be back in the pulpit of my friend of long standing, Dr. Abraham Jules. Preached for us, as Elder God said a couple of weeks ago in Huntsville, Alabama. Did a tremendous job. I've known him now for more years than I'd like to mention, but he is certainly a gift to the body of Christ. And if you appreciate Dr. Jules and Sister Jules, Dr. Jules also, let's put our hands together and celebrate them. Amen. I want to draw your attention to a very familiar passage. As a matter of fact, why don't you stand and let's just shake the hands of those who are around you. Come on, let's stand to your feet. How great is our God sing with me how great just tell them how good they look today all oh, sing how great how great just shake a few hands tell them happy Sabbath he's a name above all names he's a name above worthy of our praise And my heart will sing how great is our God. Come on, let's do it from the top. Everybody, how great is our God? How great. Listen, the Lord our God is a great God. The Lord our God is a great God. The Lord our God is a great God. Everybody say great, great. One more time, the Lord our God. The Lord our God is a great God. Lord, our God is a great God. How great, great, how great, how great is our God. Let's put our hands together for this great God. Please remain standing. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, very familiar passage. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. I'm going to read two verses in your hearing. You can turn there. You can dial there. You can, on your devices, direct your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. The Bible says... Again, these are very familiar verses. For our light and momentary, the NIV says, troubles, are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Verse 18 says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Amen, somebody. 
Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I want to talk in the spirit of this season from the subject, It's a Wonderful Life. I said it's a, we might feel like it, but it's a wonderful life. It might not look like it all the time, but every day above ground is a good day. It's a wonderful life. Our Father, we thank you. We glorify you. We magnify your name. This is of the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. We thank you for these young people. Thank you for their gifts. Not just the church of tomorrow, they're the church of right now. Great things you've done. We pray for Dr. Jules and his continued leadership in this church. We thank you for the expansion of the kingdom that we see through his ministry year after year after year. We pray that goodness and mercy would follow him every day of his life. And we pray now, God, that you would speak to us as only you can. We're going to be careful to say thank you. That's what we promise in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Shake your neighbor's hand as you go to your seats one more time. Tell them I'm glad to see you on this Sabbath. Amen, amen. It's a wonderful life. Somebody said, no matter what's going on. And in some of our lives, there's a whole lot going on, amen? My brothers and sisters, for most of us, this is the most wonderful time of the year. A season of songs, and we've heard songs today, a season of familiar faces. There are certain songs and sounds and scenes that we identify with this holiday season, am I right? Religious standards like Joy to the World and Silent Night. Old favorites like Nat King Cole's Chestnuts Roasting. Don't act like y'all don't know that song. I said Chestnuts Roasting. My, 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 my. And then if you know me, my all-time favorite, This Christmas by Donny Hathaway. I know y'all don't know that song. But these are songs that are particular to this season. If you come to my house in Huntsville, Alabama, not only will you hear old songs, but you will see old movies. Especially if my son, Justin, who lives in Manhattan now, is at home. He is a connoisseur of old classics. And you will be certain to see Miracle on 34th Street, The Bells of St. Mary. And we spend countless hours looking at White Christmas. But perhaps the old all-time holiday classic, and I put it here, is Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. Initially, many of you know it was a box office flop. But over the years, it has captivated the hearts of millions, including the minds and the hearts of those in my family. The genius of this film, It's a Wonderful Life, is that it raises classic emotional issues to an amazing level and in an interesting way. Amen? But my brothers and sisters, let me say quickly and let me say from the outset that uh, for some people, it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't feel to be a wonderful life. To hear those words, especially during this season, can be irritatingly idealistic because for them, the words just seem to mock them because Life does not seem to have treated them as they would have liked to have been treated. It reminds me of a couple of years ago, my wife and I were back in the area that we pastored for almost 20 years in California, and we were in Laguna Beach exercising that morning, and I saw a group of people down on the beach, we were on the boardwalk, and they were just laughing hysterically, and I could not understand what was so funny until I went down uh, to where they were and I asked what this group was. This group was involved in what they call laughing therapy. It was a laughing therapy group. They said, the leader told me, that uh, he would say a few words and they would just explode in laughter. It, it would move them. It would shake their limbs. And I read the brochure that they gave me. It says, laughter has healing power. 
Uh, I thought to myself, I know that merry heart, a merry heart uh, doeth well like medicine, but this seems to me to be a bit contrived. It seems to me to be a bit manufactured, a little bit over the top, because when you get through laughing, if you got problems, you still got bills to pay. I don't care what kind of laughing therapy you involve yourself in. When you get through laughing, you still have mouths to feed. You can laugh until you're red in the face, but when you get done, you still have a body that needs to be healed. Can I get a witness in this place? But this morning, my brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be confused one bit about the title of my message. My point this morning is not that everything is good, but that God is wonderful. This life might not be wonderful in many ways, but every day that we can get up on our own two feet, every day that we can awaken to the beauty of this life is a good day. It might not be a predictable, predictable life, but it's a wonderful life. It might not be a pretty life, but it's a wonderful life. It, it might not even be a, a healthy life, but it's, it's a wonderful life. Somebody said it might not be a Heathcliff Huxtable life, but it's a wonderful life. And, and, and I've come in uh, to New York this weekend to tell you that it is a, a wonderful life for at least three reasons, and I'm going to get out your way. First of all, you need to understand, we need to understand that this life is a wonderful life because it's a protected life. Amen. Protected life. But not only is it a wonderful life because it's a protected life, it's a wonderful life because it's a directed life. I sound like a Southern Baptist preacher this morning. It's a protected life. It's a, it's a directed life. And then it's an extended life, a protected life. It's a wonderful life. Can I get a witness in this place? It's, it's a life that is under the direction of God. God orders your steps. It's a directed life. And finally, I've got faith that no matter how bad it is on this side, it's an extended life. I'm looking for a life that's better than this life. If all of your priorities are wrapped up in this little life, you are in trouble. But I'm going to a place where the wicked shall cease from troubling and the weary soul shall be at rest. It's a wonderful life. First of all, it's a wonderful life because it's a protected life. Tell your neighbor it's a protected life. A protected life. The hero of the story, It's a Wonderful Life, was George Bailey. You know this story. Uh, he was played by Jimmy Stewart. He grew up in a little town called Bedford Falls. He dreams of a life of adventure and travel, but the circumstances of his life seem to have him in going to circles. And so, you know, his, his life is going nowhere fast. Anybody ever felt as if their life is going nowhere fast? I mean, you, you, you running, but you ain't get nowhere. You hear what I'm just saying? Uh, and then it seems that one new year just runs into another new year. There's a Hebrew word for that condition. What's that? It's stuck. That's what that word is. You're stuck. You're, you're stuck. And, it's, and somebody said when you get stuck like that, depression can just come up on you. No matter how much money you have in the bank, that type of depression is debilitating. No matter how many people say you're doing a great job, if you don't think that you're doing a wonderful job, then that depression can take you over. Adam was the head of a perfect family, but he was stuck. He ended up talking to a snake. Abraham was stuck. He was a millionaire from Mesopotamia, but he ended up moving without a map. Daniel was a powerful po politician, but he, but he ended up in a lion's den just because you are a member of Community Worship Center does not mean that you're immune to being stuck. Just because you're a baptized believer in the Seventh-day Adventist Church doesn't mean that you don't have problems and difficulties. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of folk who are confused right now and discouraged right now. Because some Bible instructor or some pastor convinced them that life was going to be better as far as they uh, as far as they define better, post-baptism. But for many of them, it seems that their lives have gotten worse. I came to tell you, sometimes things get worse before they get better. 
I said sometimes things get worse before they get better. And at times things need to get worse because God wants to know how bad do you want it. Y'all miss what I just said. I hear your mouth praying, but God wants to know, is your heart in it? The Bible says you will seek God and you will find God if you search after God with all of your heart. And if 2019 is going to be better than 2018, you got to go harder in 2019 than you did in 2018. Can I get a witness in this place? We are under the guidance of God. This is a protected life. Come on, say amen. Things happen all the time. Things that we can't understand. But the Bible says weeping Weeping may endure for, that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is talking about. Weeping just endures for a little while, but joy follows weeping. Come on, say amen. And I came to tell you that some of God's greatest miracles come to pass in the darkest of night. Did you hear what I said? As a matter of fact, God does some of his best work when it's dark. That's a whole nother sermon. Let me not chase that. Brothers and sisters, it's a wonderful life because it's a protected life. Somebody shout protected life. Get that in your head. It's a protected life. Get that in your spirit. It's a protected life. The song says all night, all day, angels are watching over me, my Lord. It's more than a song, ladies and gentlemen. I said this, this, this affirmation that we are being protected all day and all night is more than just a song. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 15 says that angels are ministering spirits that God sends to help us. Ellen White says in Acts of the Apostles, page 154, that we need to understand better than we do the mission of angels. Somebody shout angels. And some of y'all don't even believe in angels. You wouldn't be here if it weren't for the effort of some of these angels. Because some of y'all are trying to outrun your angels. Come on, say amen. The Bible says that angels are ministering spirits. They are charged to minister to us in a number of ways. Cherubim and seraphim and angels that excel in strength stand at God's right hand ready to minister, us, minister to us. Come on, say amen. Psalm chapter 91 and verse 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. In other words, as crazy as your life has been in 2018, it would have been crazier if not for the ministry of your angels. Some of us don't realize that the lion's share of the battle that rages in our lives rages in an area that we can't even see. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Some folk think that their problem is their Sabbath school teacher. That ain't your problem. Some folk think that their problem is that spouse that God has blessed them to have. That's just a temporary problem. But what is wrestling, what's wrecking many of our lives is not acknowledging that up above our heads there's more than music in there. We are involved in a controversy. And God has enlisted ministering angels to help us in those times when we need help. Come on and say amen. Somebody has been taking care of you. Years ago, I was in Phoenix City, Alabama, pastoring, but I was in Columbus, Georgia, doing some business. And I drive, when I drive, I drive fast. I'm just sorry. They say confession is good for the soul. Come on, say amen. As a matter of fact, it has been alleged that I can out uh, drive my angels, but that's not good theology. Come on, somebody. The reality is when I'm going, I'm going fast. And I got to a stoplight, I'll never forget, in Columbus, Georgia. I was at the stoplight already thinking about getting through that stoplight and the things that I needed to do. Anybody felt like that before? You're standing still, but you're moving in your head. The light turned green, and as I put my foot 
on the pedal, something told me, take your foot off the pedal. And I'm saying to myself, it was so strange. I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was such a strange experience that I began to argue with myself. Why you sitting here? Why you, you know you need to go. And in the midst of my argument with myself, an 18-wheeler whizzed through that intersection. And I said, thank you, Jesus, because the songwriter is right all night and all day angels are watching over us. And we need to give God the glory, not just for the things that he did in 2018 that we can see. We need to thank him for the stuff he protected us from. I said something right there. The Bible says he protects us from dangers both seen and unseen. In other words, we need to thank God for the things that he did that we could see, but we also need to thank him for the things that he kept us from. We need to thank God for that robber that didn't get into the house. We need to thank God for that molester that didn't get to our grandkids. We need to thank God for that disease that didn't wreck our body. We need to thank God for those friends, so-called friends, pseudo-friends, fake friends that didn't mess us up in 2018. Because the Bible says that God keeps us from dangers both seen and unseen. And if you're glad about it, put your hands together and thank God that he's just that type of God. Thank him for the devils that he told to leave you alone. Come on, sir. I felt that in my spirit, right? Anybody have to deal with some real devils? I ain't talking about the f flying devils. I'm talking about the ones that eat and talk like you. I felt that right there. Kept you from the devils that were digging <laughs> ditches in 2018. I'm glad that we serve a God like that. It is a wonderful life, first because it is a protected life. But not only is it a wonderful life because it's a protected life, it's a wonderful life because it's a directed life. It, it, it's a directed, it, it's an ordered, it might seem out of sorts, but there's a method to God's madness. The threads might seem disjointed, but, but how many know that God is smarter than you? Some of y'all don't even believe that. Let me get, maybe I should check this room. Let me see the hands of y'all that know that God is smarter than you. All right, make sure I'm in the right place. The Bible says that in Romans, that God works all things. To, that's unbelievable. He works things together for your good. It's a directed life. The stuff that you're crying about, you're going to be shouting about tomorrow. Not that it's a good thing, but God's going to work that thing. When God gets through putting together all of this disjointed stuff that's in your life, he can work it all together for your good. I said he can work it all together for your good. Y'all don't sound like y'all. I said he can work it all together. I spent a year looking at the sovereignty of God over against the, the activities of man and I preached a message on 3ABN and, and in other places dealing with the sovereignty of God and how it clashes with the... You know, we make some bad decisions. Then we get mad at everybody, including God. My point is, God is always working his will through the foolish decisions that we make. Because all of us are making bad decisions. Some of y'all just walk in bad decisions. We, we, we surmise or we plan our lives in A, but we live our lives in B. Am I right about it? All the plans you thought were going to come to pass. By this time, you would have been living in a four-room house. you still stuck in that apartment. Because we dream in A, but we live in B. Kids that you thought you were going to have to, you, you, you remember the obedient kids that you thought you were going to raise? <laughs> but, 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 but the baby kids that you have just, just go to tell you that God has a way of doing the impossible through incredibly challenging circumstances 
that we create. Ah, what kind of God is this? That's working miracles in arenas that you and I can't see and, and over and through mistakes that we have made. Come on, say, <laughs> it's a wonderful life because it's a directed life. That's what Joseph said to his brothers, didn't he? Joseph said, you meant it for evil. But, but God just looked all over you. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for my good. You thought that when I lost that job, I was going to lose my mind. But it took me to a whole other level of faith and faithfulness. You thought that when you left me, I was going to leave God. But I ain't going to leave God because there's no failure in God. You thought that when I got sick, I was going to get sick of God. But brothers and sisters, I don't care if I'm on my back or on my feet. God is still a good God. Yes, he is. It, it's a directed life. In 2004, I told you the last time I was here that I was doing a meeting in Indonesia and the folk were crying because they were forced into the mountains that year to celebrate Christmas. But while they were in the mountains, the tsunami hit down in the city. Did you hear what I just said? They crying in the mountains, but God drove them to the mountains to protect them. And we need to thank God for our mountains and thank him for our valleys and thank him for the storms that he brought us through. Songwriter said, if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in his word could do. But through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I learned to trust in God. If you learn through your troubles, put your hands together and thank God that not only is it a protected life, but, but it's a directed life. God is a good God. When I grew up in Memphis, we used to say, God is a good guy. Yes, he is. We go in on that. God is a good guy. Yes, he is. I said, yes, he is. And don't shout me down. I said, God is a good guy. Yes, he is. Stop playing for me, man, because we could be here for a while. I don't want to do that to y'all. It is a wonderful life. Because first of all, it's a protected life. But not only is, a, it a, is it a protected life, it's a directed life. I'm glad that God did not listen to some of the prayers that I prayed. Some of y'all felt that right then. You're going to catch it in a minute. I said, I'm glad that God didn't hear and answer. Forget to hear. Didn't answer some of the prayers that I prayed in 2018. I'm not talking about when I was a kid. I'm talking about last year. Because some folk might not be living. Come on, say amen. I just, I know y'all more spiritual than me. But reality is I'm just glad that God is not me. And I'm glad that God is not you. It's a wonderful life. Because it's a protected life. It's a wonderful life. Because it's a directed life. I don't care how nervous you get about the illness that you have. You ain't out of here until God says it's time to go. Did you hear what I just said? I don't care what the doctor says. God can still say yes if it's not time according to God's timetable. You need to rejoice. There's a work that's yet to be done. It ain't over until God says it's over. It, it, it's a... It's a, it's a protected life. It's a directed life. But, but, it, but it's, a, it, it, it's an extended life. I feel my help. It's going to go on longer than this fool. It, it, it will outlast this foolishness. I'm talking about, let me, let, me, let me check the house one more time. I still believe that we're living in the last days. And I still believe in heaven. I said I still believe in heaven. When I was growing up, they used to always say about heaven that there are going to be three surprises, Bishop Goff, in heaven. The first surprise in heaven is going to be that you got in. Because I don't care how saved you think you are, when you get there, 
after looking back over the landscape of your life, it's going to be amazing that God lets you in. But then after you get over the shock that you got in, you're going to look around heaven and you're going to see some folk in heaven that you thought shouldn't be there. You won't recognize that in those days when they were still strung out, they were pleading to God. In those moments when everybody, including their family members, had turned their backs on them, God was still on the throne and directing the activities of their life. They've been in and out of rehab one time, two times, three times. Everybody said no, but they still stand there. Then there's going to be a whole lot of folks that you think are going to be in there. Because the condition for this extra wonderful life. Well, 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 well there's a... <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a, what do you call it? There's a key word. When I was in Loma Linda, there was a gentleman by the name of Robert Martin who told us about this mission field in India that was stricken by a plague of blindness. It was, it was a progressive blindness. Follow me. And through the efforts of Loma Linda, they came up with some type of cure for that condition of progressive blindness and the people who were cured and the family members of those who were cured were understandably overjoyed now they could see their relatives could see some colors for the first time their kids that they'd never seen before but in their language they had no words that specifically lined up with thank you there were no two words that could ad adequately bring up what they felt and there was no equivalent to the two words thank you. But they did have a phrase that was equivalent. It was, I'll call your name. So instead of saying thank you, I remember they say, I'll call your name. In other words, they said, every time I think about the fact that I was blind but now I see. I'll call your name. Every time I think about the fact that this is the first time that I'm seeing my baby crawl, I'm going to call your name. Said every time I think about the bills that I would have spent on my health condition, but now I'm free, I'm going to call your name. And brothers and sisters, when you and I get to heaven, there are going to be a lot of folk that we're going to see, but there's one name that I'm going to cry above every name, and that name is Jesus. And every time I think about about what I used to be, I'm going to call his name. And every time I think about where I used to go, I'm going to call his name. And every time I think about the stuff that he snatched me out of. Anybody else in here going to call his name? I said, anybody else in here going to call his name? I said, anybody else in here going to call his name? Jesus. Jesus. The more I call him, the better I feel. Don't nothing happen when you call my name, but when you call on the name of Jesus, something happens. Let me do this. This is the most important thing that I'm going to do. Everybody stand to your feet. I'm not long because I'm trying to get here, right here. It don't make no sense coming to church and not having church. It makes no sense having come through a year of struggle, pain, bad decisions without entering into the rest that Jesus Christ offers and the direction that he gives. How do I get what I just described to you? This peace. I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about peace. You can be peaceful and unhappy at the same time. The joy that I'm talking about is beyond the purview of the world. It's something that the world didn't give and it can't take away. How do you get The Bible says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, you want what I'm talking about? He said, I'm open the door. 
come. Thank you. I'm in Atlanta for the Gospel Music Workshop of America a few months ago. And I'm trying to get to the Hyatt Regency from the Hilton Hotel, get into a concert. I'm late. And I get to a door, and the door is locked. It's closed. And I'm frustrated, yelling at the door. Why are these folks dumb enough to close this door? I'm trying to get to this concert. And a guy walked right up to me and said, what's your problem? I said, the door is locked. He said, this door ain't going to open till you move. And he walked right up to the door and through the door. Because there was a sensor on that door that would not move until we move. So it didn't make no difference how long I yelled at that door, looked at that door, laughed at that door. If I didn't move, wasn't nothing going to happen. The evangelist in me is reminding some of y'all that the reason you stuck is because you're not moving. When you move, he moves. He's not rude like that. He's not going to push through your lack of decision. When you move, so in your mind right now, we're almost done. What is it that you want God to do for you in 2019? That's consistent with his will. Now, we're going to give him some out, thy will be done room at the end of all of these prayers. But he says a lot of times you have not because you're not asking. We want to get some business done today. We want to get some strongholds broken right now. So my appeal is simply for you to, in your mind, think of that thing that you're lacking. It might be salvation. That is the most important decision that you can make in this life. If you don't get that right, nothing else is going to line up. Double-minded man is unstable, woman too, in all of his or her ways. If you don't put God in first place, all of your plans are going to come to naught. And if they do work, you need to be scared. <laughs> then there are others who have other tangible needs. I want to pray for you. Come to the altar. Whatever your need is, let's pray. Lord, you are good. You've been so good. Come on. Lord, you are good. You've been better than I can praise you enough. I owe you my life. I can't praise you enough. Even if I try, you've been. How many know he's been good? So good to me. From the top, if you know it, let's sing it. Lord, you are good. Let's sing. Lord, Lord, you are good. You've been so good. Lord, you've been good. You've been better than good. I can't praise you enough. I can't praise you enough, even if I try. You got to mean this thing. That's it. So good to me. Take it up. Come on, let's sing it like we mean it because we are going to him for something. Lord, you are good. You've been so good. I can't praise you enough even if I try. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even if I try, you've been so good as to me. Take it up one more time. Sing it like you mean it, Lord. You mean it? Lord, come on. Lord, you are, you've been so good. Father, in Jesus' name, our heads are bowed all over this building. It's the chronicler's words that we repeat 
right now and we claim by faith. It is one of my favorite and most powerful passages. It's a word to these people. The promise is, the challenge is, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Not preach, but pray. Not sing, but pray. Not struggle, but pray. None of those things are beyond your will, but you've told us specifically if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And here's the part. Turn from their wicked ways. Lord, what, what do you mean turn from them? Just turn. You got to turn before you can walk. Just turn. Turn in your mind before he turns your step. Turn from their wicked ways. He said, I'll forgive their sins. He said, first, I will hear from, what a promise. He said, I'll hear from heaven. In this great collection of church members, he's he, he, hearing every prayer, just every prayer, as loudly as I'm speaking through this microphone. He hears you as if you're the only one speaking. I will hear you from heaven. He says, I'll forgive your sin. I'll do that. I don't care what folks say. I'll forgive your sin, and I'll make you complete right now. Even while you're struggling, you'll be complete. Even while you're still wrestling, you'll be complete. Even while you're still trying to make it to the next level, you'll be complete. And then he said, I'll heal your land. I'll heal your land. I'll heal your land. Father, we pray for forgiveness in this sanctuary. It's been prayed a number of times. It's been prayed thousands of times. Forgiveness we thank you for the blood that was shed for us on Calvary. That blood that already signals that there's nothing to, uh, there's, no, there's, there's, there's no distance that you would not travel to get us. There's no sacrifice that you would uh, not make to, to save us. You've already demonstrated the best for us. So we thank you for the offer of forgiveness. We don't have to feel anything. We just say thank you. Don't need a shudder. We got faith. So we say thank you. Situation might be exactly the same as it was when we started praying, but we got it. We got it. We got it right now, right now, right now, right now, because you said it. All of your promises are yea and amen. Yes is your answer. So we're not looking for a change in our emotions. We're looking for a change in our circumstance. We have been made new creatures in Jesus Christ but then we're not leaving this altar without addressing the second promise which is to heal our land Lord these folk might not get tired of the on the journey but they can get sick and tired of the journey and there's some folk that are on the verge of giving up just before you come in in fullness they're they're listening or they're being influenced by friends who are being influenced by the devil. Help them to recognize that he who began a good work in them is going to be faithful to complete it. On this day of emphasis, children's emphasis, we pray for our children, our grandchildren. They are our heritage. And so Wherever that wayward son is, that prodigal daughter is, we pray, God, that you would demonstrate your love. We know that you love him more than we love him. We don't understand it, but we believe it. We know that you love her more than we love her. We don't understand it, but by faith we accept it. And so do for us what you did for that father who was looking day after day for that wayward prodigal to come home. Let us kill the fatted calf. Let us rejoice. Let us tell the world that my son who has lost is now home. What we want you to do is something tangible for us today. We're not going to have it because we didn't ask for it because we're going to ask for it. We want big stuff. We want to see something. Ah, uh, This is not a presumptuous prayer. 
We're going to lean on your power. We're going to follow you whether we see anything or not. But help us to see something so that the world would know that you're still moving by your power. So whatever we've brought to the altar, by faith we pray, God, that you would act on it now. We give you some thy will be done room to act according to your wisdom and timetable. But it's in your hands. In Jesus' name. If you believe you heard and answered your prayer, put your hands together as you go to your seats. Come on, go to your seats.